To life. To life. La Chaim. La what? La Chaim? There you go. I'm oh, sorry. La Chaim, La Chaim, to life. May your good fortunes never come here to whatever comes. May your good fortunes never, never come. come. <laughs> <laughs> Is that not the real word? Wow, no. We were going to do that for that one. <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's the opposite of this? <laughs> Welcome back to our stupid Rex Youths of Corbin. I'm Rick. You can follow us on Instagram, Twitter, for Insta content. Insta Tweety Poo Poo and, Caca. And uh, subscribe if you haven't, please. Hey. And like this video. Hey. Is there an opposite? Is there like a curse? Why would you want to learn that? To do it you? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Not like a witch's curse, but like the opposite of the... Well, that's supposed to take away the evil eye. Isn't this like You a... want to give me the evil eye? Ha. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That, that's what I'm going to do. Ha. <laughs> <laughs> Stupid. <laughs> I'm the first one to ever think of that. No one's ever thought of that ever. Here we go. Uh, today we got a Nasseridin Shah master class in acting. There he is in his Speedo. A master class in acting? Master really? class in acting, Nasseridin Shah in conversation. Oh my goodness, I'm excited. This is a nine minute video. Apparently, Nasseridin Shah talks about acting. And I'd be very interested, and there's a book that was sent that I started to read, and I stopped because I wanted to be in the right headspace that I'm going to jump into it this year, which is Indian Method, the, the method of particular approach to acting. It's this book called Indian Acting. Is it the one that puts his face? And it's already, the reason I stopped is I wanted to be in the right place because it's already coming at it from a vantage point that I've not seen before, mm. wonderfully. But also, I'm sure I'm going to be like, yeah, I don't know that I agree with that. And I don't want that to stop me from going full throttle into it. So be really interested to see what this One of the man legends. has to say. Yeah. Well, I'm excited about this. Oh, for good content ends here. Subscribe and hit the bell icon to never miss a film from All in the Macho. How did passion fuel my journey? So I won't give you a, a long lecture on how important it is to have passion and a certain element of madness, as Zorba the Greek called it. Huh. But I'll tell you a little story. Uh, about the first time I came to Bombay, I was 16 years old. I uh, had run away from home. That's another long story which you can read about in my memoirs if you're interested. And there were these friends who hosted me. And I got off at Bombay Central, I'm 16 years old, it's 1966. We took the local train to Bandra and they had put me up in a bungalow on Mount Mary. So we drove past, uh, when we were coming out of Bandra Station, got into a cab to go to Mount Mary. And on the way, my friend said, there's Mehboob Studio. And I turned around and I saw the emblem. It was much emptier then. The studio really stood out. Um, my heart jumped to 48 frames per second, you know. When I saw this place, I saw the outside, because I'd seen Mehboob's films, and I think he's, I, I still think he's one of our greatest filmmakers. And uh, I lived a walking distance away, and I would walk up and down, uh, just going past. I never dared even approach the Darwan, because there was no question of being let in. And, um, and today, here I am. So, I guess... <laughs> Uh, being called um, a legend and so on, which you know, I still find it hard to get my head around. No, uh, you are. So my first question to you, without uh, further ado, is why acting? Hmm. For me, personally, because it gave me a, a, okay. a sense of self-worth. I wasn't good at anything when I was a child. That's usually what you hear from great actors. And mm -hmm. to make matters worse, I had two brothers elder brothers and as all of you who are the youngest sibling would know the youngest brother is no good for god man or beast <laughs> <laughs> and both these brothers were outstanding in their own ways one was uh, uh, the brains and the other was the uh, the hero the, the cat the champion athlete and the guy with the girlfriend and so on and i was the the idiot who wasn't good at anything until i discovered my fondness for uh, poetry and my fondness for drama. And this happened when I was about 12 or 13. 
I think I'd memorized the whole of Julius Caesar when I was 13 years old. I wow. still remember every word of it. Wow. We were taught it in class. I would recite it to myself all the time and uh, it was just great bliss. I would, uh, I, w I, I would imitate actors I'd seen in movies or actors I'd seen in plays and so on. And most importantly, and people don't believe this, but it's, it's really true. There is an ailment, it's an ailment called onomatopoeia. Onomatopoeia, it's pausing, it's buffering. Come on now. Onomatopoeia means that you are impelled the symptoms of onomatopoeia are that you feel impelled to speak a line or a verse or a word or anything that you've heard or read somewhere huh. for no reason other than for the joy of saying it pardon me are you Aaron Burr sir the Dr. Dr. Lagu, who's asking you know Dr. Lagu who I consider one of the greatest theater actors I've seen described himself as a bathroom actor <laughs> like there are bathroom singers there are bathroom actors all of us are bathroom actors and uh, I'm sure many of you will find a resonance in this matter of onomatomania a lot of us have it we just don't we just find ourselves reciting a line kitne admi the, or whatever one, you, know, the, you love do we admi. just find ourselves saying it for no reason at all I think that is the main reason I I, I became an actor because I enjoyed speaking things, uh, rehearsed things. I don't enjoy, I'm not very good at starting conversations with strangers, but I do love reading aloud and I, and, and, and I do love reciting. And perhaps that is what drove me to it. Then having come into it, I found um, I can do a pop sci psychology analysis of it and give you many... Uh, intellectual reasons but I think that is really why I chose to be an actor and not a not try to join the army or, or become an engineer also because I couldn't be bothered to study <laughs> but was there like a specific moment when you saw an actor on stage and you suddenly or or in a film that you thought okay I could do that or I wish I could do that oh many many times and and, and I think right from a very early age I saw very many movies when we were in school when I was young, uh, both Hindi and English. Those, those days there were only Hollywood or British films. I'm talking of the early 50s. Uh, and I, I used to be transported. I used to imagine myself as all those people, all the time. Being on the screen somehow seemed like an impossibility because it didn't look like a real world. I didn't believe these people actually existed, these people one saw on the screen. It was when watching great stuff on the stage that I realized that it's human beings who act. And, and the man who influenced me the most, I realized later, was Jeffrey Kendall, whose performances I saw from the age of five, uh, right until he, he ended his, uh, his working career. Uh, about 50 years later. He influenced me a great deal. Um, firstly, because I was stunned by uh, the quality of his, his, his diction, his, his, his bodily um, uh, approach to every part, and his versatility. And the simplicity with which he staged things. And that's what made me realize right then that, that a play doesn't necessarily need a grand setting and, mm -hmm. and it disturbs me greatly when I see plays done by young people where they try to emulate Broadway or something like that and you see these tatty attempts at creating magnificent sets uh, and they just never work if there's anything that works on the stage from the stage what is transmitted is the stimulation of the audience's minds so I'm not at all in favor of these grand productions which try to create an illusion on the stage. Mm. The illusion has to be created in the listeners' minds. Amen. That's what I have come to believe. Amen. And I think that 
seeing Mr. Kendall and his work so early in life uh, helped me to crystallize this. And I'll tell you a beautiful little story about uh, two actors in the No Theatre, the Japanese No Theatre, which is an extremely stylized, very formal um, uh, kind of theatre which is performed in temples, where everything is codified, all the gestures, all the expressions, all the emotions are codified. There is a gesture for sadness, there is a gesture for despair, there is a gesture for anger, etc, etc. There is a gesture for pointing at the moon. Pointing at the moon. Great title. And there were two actors, one of whom, when he appeared and performed this gesture, the audience gasped because he was so graceful and so light and so beautiful to look at and so expressive and so technically proficient that when he performed the gesture, the audience gasped. There was another actor who had none of these qualities. But when he pointed at the moon, the audience saw the moon. What a great example. What a great example. Oh. Uh -oh. There's a lot of bass <laughs> coming out of that video. No joke. <laughs> that could have been an hour at, at minimum. But only, uh, without question. Talking, uh, listening to great all day, artists all day. Uh, discuss their craft and their love for, for their art and obviously there's and we he's famously the deborah dad yeah because that is the first thing even though it might sound crazy to indians the first thing we ever saw him on was the deborah we call it the deborah film because that's how that's all i can pronounce of that title that, the rithic film but when he came on we said in the review, and who was that? Who's that dad? dad? He's a thespian. Yeah, he's great. And yeah. everybody like, uh, uh, yeah, you idiots. One of the greatest actors who's <laughs> ever lived. <laughs> That's like saying Meryl Streep walks on. Yeah. Oh, she's yeah. good. <laughs> who's this Anthony Hop Hopkins? Is it Hopkins? I don't know. Yeah, but yeah, it's it's, and it was evident in the one he did this year, and mm. the 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 Pika film that I can't pronounce that obviously we loved. Uh, and we thought everybody was so high, but he was just once again on another on level, another level yeah. and the, which is crazy because he was so small in that film. Right. The fact that somebody that's their character is so small and kind of pulled back, and, but and, their and, performance and still stands out like crazy. Of course. It's just because, like he said, the guy was not he pointed to move, and people were riveted. Yeah. He. He's he a great example. He's he's um a man after my own heart. What he said about. <sighs> that last aspect of um, the connectivity between the mind and and that's why so some of the some of the simplicity um, and yeah I could I could listen not just him but I mean one of my favorite shows they don't do it anymore was the actor's studio mm -hmm. I just I could watch those back to back to back to back what? to back to back to back to back to back do you think is your perfect <laughs> so what's his name what was his name um Oh man, I see his face. Will you Ferrell just did, did the Will Ferrell, Will Ferrell from SNL. His, uh, he was so great with him. Impression of him. Uh, Rich, uh, Lipton. Lipton. That's yeah. right. Richard Lipton. Lipton. <clears throat> I used to love watching this. Oh my goodness. Uh, there's a really wonderful episode of that. You can find it on YouTube because they always took questions. The first was Lipton would do the interview where he would talk for the first half and then he'd come back to the questions. And he always asked magnificent. If you want to learn, how to ask actors good questions? Watch us. Watch the, oh, watch the actor's studio because Lipton did a great job, and put, the reason he did is because he so adored the art form. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a really wonderful episode where I think it was um, it was either Al Pacino or Robert De Niro, who's the guest, and a question came from one of the actors who was studying at the actor's studio, and nobody knew who he was at the time, and the question was coming from Bradley Cooper. And he said, hi, Mr. De Niro or Mr. Pacino. He says, my name is Bradley Cooper. He says, hi, nice to meet you. And of course, he asked a genuine question. It's very, very cool. Little did Bradley know that uh, he'd become who he is today. But I, yeah, <clears throat> we can listen to actors talk about acting literally all day long. Especially and then if somebody of his caliber who, yeah. who absolutely knows what they're talking about and absolutely backs it up with everything they've ever put on yeah. screen. Has he ever put in a bad performance? I mean, yeah, that is the caveat. They have to know what they're talking about. <laughs> yeah, obviously. Yeah. I'd be shocked if he was there. I mean, obviously not that he was in a bad film. Obviously, you could be the greatest actor and be in bad films. That's not 
and it's not always the actor. Yeah, and you can have a different approach to acting and still be a great actor. Like I don't, I don't agree with Robert Downey Jr.'s assessment of acting, hmm. um, but there's no denying that Robert Downey Jr. is a fantastic actor. Yeah. But for him, acting's lying, and I feel the exact opposite. <clears throat> I feel like acting is being truthful all the time. I think it just depends on how you look at that question. It's, it's how you look at the question. You both might be saying the exact same thing. In different ways. But you're just thinking about it in True. a different way. True. Um, well, it is, because even from his vantage point, the reason you are doing what you do is to convince someone to believe it's true. So whether your motivation is to give them truth or to give them a lie, the ultimate result is for the hearer to believe. It's just how you interpret it. That's why there's... Yeah. Belief ten, is central. That's why there's 10,000 different yeah. acting teachers... Uh, that have different methods. And many who've never been trained. Yeah. And you believe them because they're being. That's why so many kid actors are so amazing because they haven't learned anything wrong. They just, they know how to be. Sometimes it's it's better to not have training. Oh, absolutely. Because when what some you, people need the training, obviously, but I think certain actors don't need but, it at all. And they, what they you do themselves, that's all you need. But what you need, if you're an actor who's doing acting training... What you really need to have is, an, is another, uh, your coach who's ever coaching you with your acting needs to be able to see past what I would refer to and my acting teacher, one of them, referred to as your, your toolkit. Because there would be many times where I did a scene in class and some people be wowed, applauding, maybe even somebody even crying. And Christy would say, I liked it, but I saw you working. I saw you using your tools and you've got great tools, Rick. You've got really good tools, and most people wouldn't recognize them, but you know what I'm talking about. And I was like, damn it. I know exactly what she's talking about. And, and that, that helps you. You need to have somebody who'll be brutally honest and recognize whether or not you're being genuine and in the moment, or if you're just doing something to affect a, re, an, a, a response from your audience. And I, I, would, I want to listen to him go on and on about acting all day. I want to work with him. Yeah, my goodness. You kidding? <laughs> on stage or screen. Huh? Oh. I would love to. I know he does theater all the time. I know. But obviously, since we're, we are have no access to it, unfortunately. I know. Also, we just happen to be in Mumbai or wherever he's doing a, a play, but he's one of those I'd Instantly, I would be, if we were if we were in Mumbai and I found out he was doing something on stage, I would cancel whatever was happening yeah, absolutely. to go see him on stage. Absolutely. But Did, anyways. Didn't he and Irfan do Waiting for Godot? I don't know if it was Irfan, but I know he did Waiting for Godot. But that would have been. <sighs> Good freaking grief. Are you kidding me? One of the greatest things I've ever Are seen. Are you kidding me? Yeah, oh. and he's he's getting up there. I don't know how old he is, but obviously he's old. Well, he said he was 16. It was 1966. That means he was born in 1950, which means he turned 72 this year because that's the same year as my mom. Okay, so he's yeah. still young. So still young. He's still he could may he have another 25 years, another quarter century of work with us. Another 50. That's not gonna happen. Another 50. Yeah, no, it's there. Anyways, let us know uh, what should be our next in the Saturday show. I want to get to some of his yeah. amazing younger performances. And more acting things. Yes, of course. People talk about the craft. Haters, script to screen comparison. That one. How about that one? Let us know if down below.